Windy Brow Farms in New Jersey, since 2018, has made an ice cream called Taylor Ham and French Toast. That's right, Taylor Ham and French Toast. And it's meant to be a celebration of uh, our pork roll that's been sold in New Jersey since 1856, uh, Taylor's prepared ham. Uh, get in your mind, think glorified spam as a New Jersey treat. But processed pork in creamy ice cream? How many are revolted by this idea? <laughs> only, a, only a handful are revolted by this idea? Okay, how many would you, how many, all right, that just doesn't help us at all. <laughs> how many would eat this ice cream? All right, about, about half of you. All right, you can leave. <laughs> out, out you go. I mean, here's, I love bacon. I love ham. What I would tell you is I've never had ice cream with bacon on it, and I've had many, that's actually been good. It usually makes the bacon not very good, and the ice cream only so-so, and I, those sort of things are glorious things. Anyway, what may be utterly revolting and gross to normal people <laughs> might not be to you, and you might consider delightful treats. And we know this is a silly illustration. No one of us would seriously defriend, belittle, or break fellowship or disagreement over spam ice cream, would we? I mean, we might not sit next to you when you're eating it, but we would still love you, wouldn't we? A couple weeks ago, we celebrated the, the Reformation and the, uh, remembering the five solos, uh, salva right, right, salvation by God's grace alone on the basis of Christ alone, received by faith alone, all for the glory of God alone. And we know this by Scripture alone. And the, the point of this, these five solos in the Reformation is that salvation is God's gift. It's His grace it's undeserved, it's unmerited. It's what he gives to undeserving people to us. And our only part in salvation is that we trust God. We trust that salvation is God's work, not our work. We trust that we are God's work. That we, we are not of our own work, but that we are God's work. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we say it, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good, good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. In our series, in which I know you are tired of, going through Romans 12 through 15, and I'm almost there. We've been talking about who are we as individuals, as a congregation, as the people of God. Who are we called uh, to be? And we, uh, we are called to be children of grace. We are children of the God of grace. And what are we called to do? We are called to live out that character of our God and live out grace, live out love. Two weeks ago, we said that we are a people that are unified in our essentials, that we give and live in liberty in the non-essentials of our faith, that there's, there's differences and yet we, we have freedom in that. And in all things, we live as a people in charity and love with each other. Today, we are learning in God's word, that people that live out grace, that live out God's love, don't destroy faith, but they build up faith in others. People that live out this character of grace, live out the very purpose of God. We don't destroy faith in others, we build up faith in others. We live out grace by not tearing people's faith down, but by building them up. Okay, think about uh, uh, as a fire. We, we, we make a fire, and we have a fire pit, and that starts with a little ember, right? We could squat. We don't, we don't put out that ember with water. We don't destroy the fire. We actually, what do we do to actually get, you, have to, you blow on it, you, you tend it, you, you, you encourage it to grow. 
Our faith is like a fire that we need to help encourage and grow each other, not put out and smother in each other. Reminding of the context of this, of the verse that we read today, Paul is dealing with Christians that are in Rome that are both Jewish and Gentiles, Gentiles being non, everyone else that isn't Jewish, that they come from different cultures and backgrounds. And part of this issue is uh, the Jewish people that have become Christians and become followers of Christ have, are living in this tension of their culture that have lived in these holiness or purity laws that God gave to his people. You remember, God picked out Abraham. He called of Abraham, people out of Abraham. He eventually gave, rose up Moses into those people and gave them a, a, the moral law, who the, defining the character of God. And he gave them ceremonial and purity and holiness laws, trying to demonstrate the holiness and character of God, how he is radically different than his people or, or the world. And how he's, God is set apart and he's creating his people to be set apart, radically different, holy than the rest of the world. And so live in these holiness laws so you are symbolically separated from the world as you live in the world. And some of these ceremonial holiness laws, food was one of those things. Food often in ancient Eastern cultures and even in our time, food is dedicated to other gods and offered to them. And that became a barrier for people. When a food is blessed to a God or offered to a God, how do you eat that food? We do that today. You might sit around your table, and before a meal you say grace. You you bless the food. You ask God to bless this food. You dedicate it. It's the same thing. If you had a a non-Christian come in their home, they might be offended by that. They might not. They might not care at all about that. But if you had a food and it was dedicated to another god, that might be a barrier. The Old Testament dietary laws that certain foods were, were defined as unclean, to set apart. Don't eat these. Be different than everyone else. Jesus comes into this world and fulfills all righteousness, fulfills all holiness. Says, Look, at, I am the one that is set apart. I am the invisible God made visible. I'm the holy one. And that all these dietary and ceremonial laws, they're actually pointing to me. They're pointing to how I am holy and radically different. And he's saying, look, it's it's this shadow. All these these ceremonial holiness laws in the Old Testament were a shadow of the substance, which is me. Not the moral law. The moral law Jesus fulfills. You can read the book of Hebrews. This talks about the shadow and substance things. But Jesus says this in Mark 7, verses 15 to 23. He says, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And thus Jesus says, You're okay to eat bacon. And so we praise God for that. He doesn't see eat bacon ice cream, though. That was not, that's unclear in this. In this. We're not sure about it. But he said... When he had entered the house and left the people, his disciple asked him about this parable. He said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, what is expelled? Thus he declared all food cleans. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. From, from within, out of the heart, this center of who you are, come evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, Murder, adultery, covenant, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things, evil things, come from within, and they defile a person. He said, look, it's not the things that are outside that make you unholy. You are unholy by the very definition of who you are that resides within you. This is not something that anyone else does to you. This is everything that comes from the very depth of your hearts. And only Jesus can make you holy. Only Jesus can make something clean and pure. This is not a problem you solve. Jesus comes to fulfill all righteousness and all the holiness. The problem is in this time period is that the Jewish Christians believe that, that they still had to follow these dietary and ceremonial laws. They're trying to be faithful to their God and how this is what they're thinking, how they're being faithful. Even though they might not fully understand the freedom yet that comes in Christ. 
not freedom from the moral law, but the freedom to live all that Christ gives. And Paul's saying, these people that are still growing in their understanding of faith and the freedom of Christ, they are still included in the faith. They are not excluded. They are not to be looked down upon. And one of these issues is that these Jewish Christians feel they cannot commune, they cannot break bread, they cannot have fellowship with those that eat certain foods. They can't be at the same table. So they're unable to commune with Gentile Christians. So there's fractures in this community. There's division on a non-essential. And Paul is trying to focus us, be unified in the faith. Be unified in the faith in what God does, not what we do. Be, Be unified in the gospel when the gospel is what God does, not what you do. God is the one that saves. God is the one that makes righteous. God is the one that makes holy. Be unified in this thought, in this truth of the faith. Romans 14, 14. Paul says, I know, I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. I know the truth of the gospel. I know the freedom of Christ. And I know that you don't know that yet. And I'm not going to smother you. I'm not going to put out your faith. I'm not going to look down upon you. He lays out practical ways in which we engage each other as our brothers and sisters. People that live out grace grace, don't destroy faith. Romans 14, 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. But what you eat do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Romans uh, uh, verses 20 and 21. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is, in, is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat and drink wine to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. stumble. I actually just thought about this illustration. So Luke empties the dishwasher in our house. He is a real critic about how the dishwasher cleans things. And he will look at a fork or a plate, which seems perfectly clean by everyone else's standard, and he will say, unclean. I cannot eat from this. This is the, And he puts it back in the sink, and we're like, what is happening here? First of all, like, if you think it's unclean, clean it. <laughs> but like, it's, it's like unworthy for him to touch the standard. But like, look at, you know what? If it's unclean, he needs to clean it and make it clean. He, he has a standard. We're just like, we're not going to live by that standard. Like, I'm going to eat from that plate. But if you can't, make it clean. This is a little bit what Paul is saying. It is, the, is the principle it is simple. He's talking to those strong in the faith, strong in understanding in the freedom of Christ, those that might have maybe matured a little bit in their faith. He says, the principle is simple. Have some grace. Have some grace and realize that everybody's journey in their faith, in their sanctification, in their walk with God is different. Everyone is God's work. Everyone is not your work. God has a journey and a path for them. And you are a part of that journey and path. But have some grace. Have some patience with that person, and realize the rate of growth, probably in yourself, is not fast enough for some people in your life. Probably yourself. Do not destroy God's work. We are God's work. Do not destroy it. We don't want to be opposing or trying to counter the work that God is doing in his child. If if you make a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of that person that they're not going to grow in their faith, you are not walking in love for them. Your job is to help them grow in their faith. Even though that you know you are right, and Paul knows he is right. Paul knows the truth of the gospel. Paul is persuaded by Christ that he can eat anything. but in matters that are only crucial to the gospel is what he's going to hold fast to. That he's going to make sure that this is what we are united on. 
He's not going to let those other things be a hindrance for someone else's faith and their journey with God. The only stumbling block for someone, this is scriptural, the only stumbling block for someone is Jesus Christ. That's the only stumbling block we put in anyone's way. <laughs> and we really don't put it. We just reveal it that he is the stumbling block. People must come to terms with Jesus. They do not need to come to terms with you. We want to introduce them to Jesus. Have you met our Lord? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he's done? Do you know how he loves you? Do you know how much this love goes, grows for you? Do, you? do you know how depth and the width of that and the height of that love for you? And people still stumble over that love. But you are, if you're walking in love, you are laying down your life, your rights, your opinions for the benefit of that other person to know Jesus. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. If you need to abstain from a food or drink in the presence of a certain people or person, then you abstain. That's the principle which Paul's saying. That's how you love them. If you need to abstain from eating bacon in my presence, please do. That's how you love me and save all the bacon for me. <laughs> I mean, you get, you get the principle. It's clear. If, if this something is going to whatever bother this person so deeply, and it's not a matter of who Jesus is, well, for a moment you can abstain. Like, I'll go have my bacon. I'll go have my bacon ice cream when you're not around, if that's so offensive to you. It's a silly principle in the sense of what Paul is very regret, but it's a serious thing that's dividing these people. If you need to assert your right to eat anything, that is not love, what Paul is saying, but that's selfishness. Years ago, and Jess and I were in New Jersey, I worked in a church as a uh, youth director, and um, I was not as wise or kind or mature or soft-spoken and as I, was, was, as I am now or growing to be. And so the, the senior pastor and I, we have these staff meetings, and we got in this shouting match for like two or three hours about alcohol. And he actually kind of liked that we were arguing about this. But the issue was that we had these um, um, progressive dinners at this church where you, you like have an appetizer at one person's house, and everyone goes to another person's house for the main meal, and everyone goes to the uh, dessert house, right? What a great idea. If someone wants to organize that here, I'm all for that. If you want to feed uh, me, no bacon ice cream, no. Uh, but the issue was that this, at one house at dinner, they were serving alcohol. And a person of the congregation really complained about that because uh, they knew there was people in the church that actually struggled with alcohol. But why would we serve that in front of them? And so him and I had this kind of knockout argument about that. I really didn't win that argument because I was the youth director and not a senior pastor on that. But it, it was, to me, it was the principle. is like, if it's going to be a stumbling block for a person, why would we do it? Now, I also understand the argument, like, you don't play down to everyone. You don't play up to everyone's anxiety as well either. That most people that could actually can handle all this. But it's one of the reasons, you know, we could serve wine for our communion. That is an okay thing for us to do, according to a book of order. One of the reasons that I have never pushed for it because this congregation has a long history and there's a lot of people that are recovering alcoholics. I don't need to put that in front of them. Even though most of them actually could handle it quite well. They could deal with not with making a choice between grape juice. But why do I need to? It's not the element itself that we're really concerned about. There's a principle here. If I love my fellow brothers and sisters, I will lay down my rights in life to be in communion with them. If we put up barriers to people other than Christ, we are not loving them as Christ loved them. Do not let your actions destroy the work of God. The work of God is the other person. Because Christ died for them, so ought you die for them as well. You can let your minor theological issues or opinions die for that person. 
your unloving actions could lead others to deny the truth and the gospel become they come so focused on that minor thing instead of the major thing we are to demonstrate godly love to the world first and foremost we want people to know jesus we want them to either embrace him or stumble on jesus We are to be a community that demonstrates godly love to the world, first and foremost, by the actions in our community of faith. When a visitor comes in here, how do they see us behaving and acting towards each other? How does this congregation act towards each other on a Sunday morning and beyond? Are we warm? Are we hospitable? Are we kind? Are we gracious to each other? Not to the visitor I'm talking about. You ought to do those things to the visitor. But to each other, how are you treating each other? Or are you cold, judgmental, standoffish? What would that visitor or outsider say if he had a secret shopper come in? People that live out grace do not destroy faith. People that live out grace build up faith in others. That is our task Romans 14, 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and a peace and a joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. God's kingdom is not like the world. It is not about trivial matters and do's and don'ts. It's not about eating or drinking. It is about righteousness. It's about Peace, and peace is, is not the absence of conflict. It's this harmony being reconciled with God and his people, living in harmony and peace with all of God's creation, union with Christ. It's the peace that makes no sense in the circumstances in the world. It's, it's the imagery we talk about in this church, is that this diverse group of people, are yet we are unified together on who Jesus is. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. The kingdom of God is about joy. It's a joy which is this deep sense of contentment no matter the circumstance. And we know life is hard. Life does not deal a fair hand. There's real painful moments in life. And yet, because you are God's child and you live in his kingdom, you can still be content in that terrible, horrible circumstance, that grievous circumstance, and still have joy that you are Christ, that you belong to him, that there's more, and that he loves you, and that love will never abandon you. And understand that nothing separates you from that love. Jesus tells us in Mark 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God, love, uh, righteousness, uh, uh, peace, joy, and seek first his hugs, first of all, and the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Put the first things first. Pursue God's kingdom, I mean, pursue God's righteousness, peace, and joy. Not asserting your rights and privileges, but seeking the welfare and the blessing of the people next to you. Your neighbors. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Loving our brothers and sisters is about building them up. That's the task at hand for us, building them up. You learn this in coaching. Maybe you've had a coach, right? There is a mentality of coaching is that I need to tear down these, my players so I can build. I don't know why I made them. I don't know why I did that. Sorry for all. Laura Lee, John, I'm sorry about that. That was slanderous. I, I tear them and sort of build them up. But the reality is it might work for some, it's still a terrible way to coach. There's actually one sure way to coach. Build them up. Build them up. That is always a good way to coach. 
someone. Build them up. You can still correct, but build them up. Colossians 1.28. Him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone all wisdom that we represent everyone mature in Christ. This is our job is to build each other up in faith, not destroy it and tear it down. This is a mentality. It's not do as I... It's not this mentality is do as I say and not as I do. It, this is Jesus' way. It says, do as I do. That's what Jesus tells us. He says, do as I do. Follow me. Walk in my way. Don't just look at me and say, hey, that's good for him. He walks a certain way, so we follow him because it's his character in which he's creating us. He models the love for us. Model the love of Jesus for others. Don't assert your rights, but lay down them for the benefit. We will build each other up in our faith, presenting each other mature in Christ by first and foremost modeling the righteousness of Christ that God is working in us, that love and that grace-filled life that he's working in us. If eating or drinking or something going to be a stumbling block for that person, abstain. Abstain. It's a minor sacrifice compared to what Christ sacrificed for you. I can eat and drink and have that freedom when they're not around. The principle is clear that Paul gives. Love builds up. The question for us, which, is the, which way do I need to love the person next to me or in front of me or around me? How will the love that I give them encourage them and strengthen them? That takes some wisdom. That takes some discernment. In which way can I build this person up? How do I need to love them in that way to build them up and not destroy their faith? Those are the questions you need to be asking yourself. How can I encourage this person? What are the ways in which I can do that? People that live out grace don't destroy faith. They build up faith in others. Salvation is God's grace alone, on the basis of Christ alone, received by faith alone, all for the glory of God alone. He is prepared for us and inviting us into his work of salvation. It's his work. He's inviting us in the work of the salvation into his people. That work is for us, that God created for us to do. To walk in before we were born was to build up faith in God's children. That work is to encourage and let faith flourish in God's people. Let not our words, actions hinder or destroy the faith of others. Let not our rights or opinions or freedom harm or distract the emerging faith of others. Turn to your neighbor right now. And say, neighbor, I am weak. Turn to your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, build me up. That's your job. You're, you're each weak in the faith and you need each other to build each other up in faith. God is using each and every one of us to build each other up in faith. That's the work in which he's created for you to do. And not just the people in this room. You could start here, but the people of God that haven't been found yet. This is your work. This is not whether we eat ham-infused ice cream. God forbid. This is how we can support each other in the faith. May we be a community. May we be a people that prioritize the growth and maturity of each other's faith. In that pursuit, in that pursuit, in prioritizing the growth and maturity of each other's faith, we will find our maturity as an individual and a community. Let us pray. Gracious God, I am so thankful that you have chosen these people that you are working in us. that you're working in me, that we are not complete. I thank you, you have given us a purpose and vision for this life. 
not to walk alone, but to walk with each other and to encourage and to build up, that you are using each and every one of us to encourage and build up faith in each and There's not a single person here that does not have that purpose. There's not a single person in this room, Lord, that you know that actually you have not done in that work for them, that work of actually encouraging others. Lord, I ask you to give the vision, the encouragement to show how you've used each and every one of us to encourage that you are a God that is not done, that you're a God that is present and working. Grow us in that maturity as an individual, as a congregation, as the people of God. This is your people. This is your work. Lord, help us to build each other up. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.